Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahka Moin. Uh, on behalf of the entire Entrepreneurship Strategy Interest Group, I welcome all of you to our today's session. And we all appreciate the support and help of Ryan and everybody else at the SMS office that really allow for these new innovations uh, to take over. So the Entrepreneurship and Strategy IG is very excited to see all of you in SMS London. And since the start of the pandemic, we have really expanded our offerings and engagement with members way beyond the three, four day conference that we used to get together. And the Insights series is part of that effort. Another parallel program that we have is the summer uh, seminar series that uh, another one of our reps, Colin Cunningham, is running in. Please stay tuned for hearing more about that series as well. Uh, for the ENS Insights series that you're all joining us today, uh, this is our efforts to bring together entrepreneurship scholars to really get to know the state of the art field, art of the field with respect to emerging areas. And uh, one of our reps, Sandy Yu, as kindly and diligently has been organizing this series. And Sandy is, a, is an assistant professor of strategic management and entrepreneurship at the University of Minnesota. Her work extensively looks at ways in which entrepreneurs pursue their funding and growth. And she has looked at this phenomenon from the perspective of either accelerators, crowdfunding, and venture capital startups. Her work on accelerators and are, are, are in particular very illuminating. So I encourage all of you to also check Sandy's work. So without further ado, I'll pass it to Sandy to take over as our leader of this series. Thank you, Maka. Thank you all, for the... Thank you all again for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maka, for the introduction, also for kicking off our our insight series. So I'm really excited that we have you know, a couple speakers lined up for this year and to have uh, David here today to kick off our series. Um, so one of the things that is special about the insight series is that rather than focusing on one specific paper, we're kind of hoping you take on a broader approach and of course to take a look back at what's been done, but also look forward at you know, what might be upcoming, upcoming exciting research that uh, scholars can start looking into. And so uh, after today's session, I also just want to put in a reminder that we have uh, our next talk scheduled for June 7th, uh, featuring Olaf Sorensen from UCLA. And that topic will be the spatial ecology of entrepreneurship. So you're welcome to register, start registering for that at this point. Uh, okay, so I wanna bring the focus back to today. It is my, my pleasure to introduce and welcome Professor David Su. David is the Richard A. Sapp Professor of Management at the Wharton School at UPenn. Uh, David has extensive work looking at entrepreneurial innovation, in management, specifically uh, IP management, commercialization strategy, uh, venture capital and startup innovation. And so we are so excited to have him here today to share some insights about the entrepreneurial perspective of organizing for innovation. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome David to the stage. Okay, <clears throat> Sandy, thank you. Maka, thank you. Ryan, thank you. And <clears throat> thank you for those attending today to take uh, and taking out some time from your day to, uh, to, to tune in. Um, as Sandy mentioned, what I'm gonna try to do is to really uh, be a little bit broader in the lens. I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Hopefully you can um, all see that. The, the purpose here is to really <clears throat> try to think more broadly about a body of work and how, um, to take stock of what we know and what we could, the paths that we could travel um, on a certain area of domain. And I'd like to share with you, um, you know, some more emergent work that I've been doing and projections going forward. I have two time slots within the presentation in which I'm gonna invite you to really kind of have an open discussion because um, I really don't want this to be a one-way push of information. That's really not the point here. Um, I'd like to kind of engage uh, with some of your thoughts and ideas on how to push some of these areas forward. So without further ado, let me uh, just dive in here. 
Um, so David, uh, may I interrupt for a second, if that's yeah. okay? I think uh, our audience have problem with uh, the video. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is fixed. Jack's calling. Uh, would you please confirm in the chat if the issue is resolved? We're gonna try again. Okay, should should be good. I'm seeing David. Okay, I, I've just shared um, slides and I've forwarded one. Can you guys all see that? Yep, we can see that. Great. Okay. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a motivating slide. This is not my own research. This is um, work by uh, Aurora et al. Published in SMJ, and there's it's a kind of a busy slide. But I, what, what I'd like you to pay attention to is over the decades, R and D intensity is going up, annual patenting going up. Meanwhile, annual publications going down, particularly plummeting over the the decade of the 1980s. And this, I think, is an important trend in the fact that we are spending, at least in the United States, more effort on the D part in the corporate world rather than the R part of R&D. And this slide kind of motivates some of the research that I've been doing in terms of the locus of innovation. I've kind of come up with this typology that I'm gonna show you now. It does look suspiciously like the Porter's Diamond Framework, but it's really not that. Uh, let me just kind of decompose this just a little bit. I'm not gonna cover all of this in today's talk. But um, the outcome of what I believe some of these drivers are is going to be this organizational locus of innovative activity that's shifting over time from large established firms to more entrepreneurial firms. And I think there's at least three big components of what may be driving this. I'm only gonna really spend time on the, the one with the star, the markets for technology. But just to, to start there, you know, if you can source as the established company innovation upstream from universities or acquire them in the market for acquisitions, then maybe that could substitute for your need to do it in-house, right? And so we're gonna talk about mostly about that today, but there's some other levers um, that I've been uh, doing some research on and project going forward that also could be driving this locus of innovative activity. Something about the technical advance itself and the implications for commercial opportunities, as well as how innovation financing is organized. I'm gonna put those things into the background because I don't think we're gonna have time for those uh, today. And of course, all of this happens in this context of how the business operates in the kind of government framework, uh, policies that really govern this type of relationships. Okay, so let's zero in on markets for technology a little bit. And here again, you know, this idea that universities and startups operate in the up upstream incumbent firms acquiring the innovations in the downstream. Now that would work well if there's an active market for which there's not that many frictions of the transfer of the know-how, the innovation, the technology, but there are famous examples in which this breaks down, right? So one salient one, founders of Google, they really never wanted to, to really commercialize that themselves. Uh, it was only because they failed to license their search technology to the incumbents of the time, AltaVista, Yahoo, that they decided, okay, I guess we have to do this ourselves. And so more generally in some prior work, which I'm not gonna review, you know, you should think about some sources of friction in this market for technology, <clears throat> whether they be the cost of identifying the appropriate partner, the bargaining process associated with how that uh, flow works. And I think the problem is compounded because for many, startups, particularly from universities, we often talk about this kind of embryonic blue sky type of characteristics of these technologies. And then of course, this very well-known kind of arrow paradox, which I'll kind of summarize in this cartoon from the New Yorker, you know, the worker here, which is like the boss, uh, worker like the startup goes to the boss who is akin to the established company. You know, the boss takes a look at the advance and says, hey, this is brilliant. Where'd you get all my ideas, right? And so knowing that this could, this expropriation ha could happen, maybe, you know, the startup never goes to the established company for that transfer of technology in the first place. Um, so with that kind of background, what I'd like to do is to dive a little bit into a couple of studies that I've been doing that really try to think deeply about uh, the university channel of innovation. And then some, after that, we'll pause to do some questions, Q&A, your thoughts, 
And then I'll flip it over to a, a few other studies on the market for startup acquisition type of studies and then a parallel structure of questions um, and discussion there. Okay, so let's get to the university one. One thing that we might wanna know is like, how big of an opportunity is this really in terms of universities coming up with innovations that could be potentially commercialized or transferred? And that's actually a really hard question to answer and quantify because of all the things we talked about before, you know, lots of the technology coming from universities never really the the goal or mission of the universities is not necessarily to produce commercializable technologies and we could the list could go on uh in terms of how why this is hard to, to really study but one thing we do know is that there are plenty of important firms and technologies this is just scratching the surface here a little bit in terms of when we especially if you think about this notion of you know, more deep technology, not just, you know, lowest hanging fruit type of innovations. We often think about the real game changers really need some deep incubation in order to, and, and you know, emerge when the time is right and exactly when we need them in society to really benefit, uh, uh, you know, benefit society. So we all know about the importance of these things. Let's try to quantify how big is this untapped opportunity. So one thing that we know, if we just kind of aggregate the, the millions of patents out there that are held by universities, put those in one bucket, and those, those millions of patents that are uh, uh, you know, assigned to corporations, we know that using our usual metrics of innovation quality, patent quality importance, that there is no doubt that on all of these metrics, university patents are much more quantitatively important relative to those patents that are being produced by corporations. And this here is just, again, just very descriptive. All I'm plotting here is on the y-axis, the licensing income that a university gets uh, logged. Uh, on the x-axis, you've got the R&D expenditure, expenditures by institution, again, logged. Now, if there are perfect kind of translation of innovation or R&D inputs, to uh, licensing dollars, you'd be on that red 45 degree line. But uh, you know, there's obviously lots of dispersion below that. The thing I wanna draw your attention to is you can pick any level of the X axis, pick, I don't know, log six, and look at that dispersion of, of the translation that universities do on average. Some are really doing very little in terms of licensing activity. Others are closer to that 45 degree line. The statistics that we often report don't take into any any of this in, this nuance into account. This is taken from this university, uh, you know, Association of University Technology Managers, and they often try to quantify how important are these university innovations, and they get these really nice statistics that are you know quite large. But the difficulty with interpreting this, of course, is we don't you know we're not controlling for a bunch of stuff, right? So we just have simple metrics, you know, we're going to then kind of compare ourselves to some other peer universities, but we're not taking into account different inputs, we're not taking in, into account kind of inherent patent value, et cetera, et cetera. So let me tell you about a methodology that we're going to take to try to get at this a little bit. We're going to match university patent portfolios to publicly held U.S. firm patents, right, just by patent characteristics. Then we're going to use like this market reaction event study methodology. These corporations, their market cap moved by X percent upon this event of being granted patents of these characteristics. We're then gonna try to you know, assemble a model. We, we're gonna actually have some ground truth data from one large US university. Most importantly, from this university, we have the zeros. Those, that, those innovations, those patents that yielded zero as well as the entire distribution, we're gonna fit that model using uh, that one research university. Then we're gonna extrapolate it to all US universities. And then we're gonna come up with this estimate, which is 16%, which is compares what is the actual value captured, I'm putting that in quotes because that's the licensing revenues that universities get, as compared controlling for all those other you know, forces relative to a notional patent value that if corporations held the exact same patent portfolio as the universities, 
how much they would garner in terms of valuation. And so that 16%, it's hard to interpret. Is that a low number? Is that a high number? But we put it out there because it's a point of focus. And mo most importantly, that's the average. There's plenty of dispersion. Uh, I should have looked up the standard deviation on that, but it's, there's plenty of dispersion around that 16%. And if you want to know more about this methodology, check out this paper that was published last year in Research Policy on benchmarking U.S. patent uh, value. Okay, so that gives us some lay of the land. How much, how much is out there in terms of what could be translated to, to value from universities? Let's ask the second question. So this is actually a tough one, right? What factors increase the likelihood that a university-originated or technology is commercialized via this very specialized pathway, a startup, right? And that's incredibly hard to, to answer because university technologies are embryonic. Most aren't fit for being commercialized. Oftentimes, what's the output of our colleagues in, in the STEM uh, areas? They'll publish a paper like this. You know, let's just read the, the title, not that any of us really understand it, but abnormal splicing of the leptin receptor in diabetic mice. Right? Is that commercializable? How much is that worth? Could that be valuable for an outside firm? Well, that's really hard to answer. What if there's a parallel, in a parallel universe, there's another paper that is, so that original paper is on the left. Now we have another paper that was published around the same time period by a different team, a different institution. Let's read the title of that one. Evidence that the diabetes gene encodes the leptin receptor identification of a mutation in the leptoreceptor gene in mice. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, to, to the untrained eye, this seems to be this universe in which two teams happen to have hit on some simultaneous discovery. Now, what if I further told you, one of these teams proceeded to commercialization, yet the other team did not via startup. Now, all of a sudden, we have some, a little bit of a baseline to know that this innovation could be translated or commercialized to startup because some other simultaneous discovery happened as well, right? Now, that's obviously hard to generalize from, from one case. What we're gonna do in this project is try to really scale this up. And so algorithmically, we uh, follow this methodology to really identify when simultaneously, simultaneous scientific discoveries happen. I won't go through all the elements of that, of that algorithm, but just to kind of uh, um, fix some ideas. You know how sometimes when you cite a paper, you don't know exactly who to cite. So in that same parentheses, you cite two authors, three authors, three teams. That probably gives us a clue that future researchers cannot disambiguate who is the singular originator of that idea. We're gonna put on other criteria as well in terms of identifying these simultaneous discoveries, but we end up generating 20,000 of these simultaneous discoveries. Now, most of those 20,000, both pairs do not proceed to commercialization. We only keep the pairs in which at least one proceeds to commercialization. What does that allow us to do? Well, now all of a sudden we can understand, you know, holding the nature of the technical advance really fixed we can look at the characteristics of the team. We can look at characteristics of the local environment. So for example, did one of these pairs proceed to commercialization because they were in Cambridge, Massachusetts while the other was in New York, right? And so while holding constant the nature of this, this advance, we can analyze the composition of these author teams. Was one team much more multidisciplinary uh, than the other? Or was it a team of deep experts all in the same field? And we can, categorize these explanatory variables into these two big buckets. One is about the, the business ecosystem, like the regional venture capital landscape, the institutional environment, you know, how many, how many R&D dollars flow to that university in terms of university prestige, or it could be something about the local team itself and characteristics of that, right? Is there a star, an academic star, a commercial star, some characteristics of that team, is it focused, et cetera? Let me just jump to the, the results. So we put it in this framework. Most importantly, twin fixed effects. If you don't put these on, these characteristics of what we always find in the literature, venture capital and munificence, et cetera, always positive. But if you put in the twin fixed effects, 
all these resource munificence type of characteristics really are indistinguishable statistically from zero. And instead, what you find is that these discovery team composition characteristics have much more explanatory power in terms of this startup commercialization. So that's, if you're interested in, in so that's just a, a kind of a, a teaser here. If you're interested in more details of this, check out this management science paper published uh, last year on um, entrepreneurial commercialization of academic science. Okay, and then I'm gonna have just disclose one more study before I, I pause for a break to discuss university innovation. So in this third paper, we wanna really do down, you know, get down in the weeds. We're gonna go to one university technology transfer office. Luckily, they're cooperating with us. They, they give us their entire 30 plus year history of invention disclosures, outcomes, licensing outcomes, those that, that yielded zero, those that yielded multi millions of dollars. Um, and then just kind of ask what's going on. If we thought about the university technology transfer office as another organization, albeit one that's much more complex in that, think, think about the hybrid mission that, that is typically associated here. On the one hand, as a university, we're in the business of diffusing knowledge, knowledge for the public good. But on the other hand, increasingly, we're relying on universities to translate for, the, for economic returns, for you know, translation to societal benefits. All those things are being imposed. And so not surprisingly, there's a, a bunch of mixed incentives, environments that are associated with this university technology transfer office. And so we're gonna look into some of these organizational factors that come into play. And this is research um, that is in working stage uh, form right now, but I just wanna kind of uh, briefly review it. I think the title says everything that we wanna communicate. The outsized role of academic stars in university technology licensing. It may not surprise you to learn that when you are an academic star, as contrasted to a commercial star, you are going to have a lot of influence inside academia. After all, publishing is the currency of academia, while arguably patents are the currency of the commercial world. We do this quantitative case study of 30 years of internal administrative data of this unnamed prominent US research university. And we find that star academics much more likely to, to kind of uh, visit the patent office with their applications. Um, and the, the patent office, the technology transfer office is much more likely to file those patents from the stars. But on the other hand, they're much, those patent applications are much less likely to be granted by the USPTO, the patent trademark office, as compared to a non-star. Moreover, in terms of outcomes, these patents by stars are less likely to be renewed upon the anniversaries that are relevant. They um, have fewer afford citations, and they're really no different in licensing revenue than non-stars. But what does predict commercial success seems to be if you are a com have commercial experience and that you've licensed a prior patent, you're much more likely to be licensed in the focal patent and yield a lot more revenue as compared to inventors without such experience. Okay, so now let's take stock. I've just closed three studies that are a little bit, I think, unconventional in the SMJ or SMS world. One is at the kind of broad level of the university comparing it to you know, how valuable is it? Then I talked about translating advances to um, commercial outcomes via startup, um, via startup vehicle. And then I just talked about like the deep dive inside one technology transfer office. This is like a quantitative case study of the experience of one university. And I think that, I really think that, um, you know, there was one flare up of research and in university innovation probably around 20 years ago. And then like, as far as I can tell, pretty silent for a while. But now I think we're on the cusp of, you know, the age of big data for which we can revisit some of these questions with the benefit of either data that's archival or, you know, just available to us. And I'll illustrate that. Or if we can, you know, use our other methodologies to really kind of dive deep to really look at what could be going on organizationally and maybe even 
move beyond archival into some kind of field experiments, et cetera. Let me just kind of, I know I've been talking for a while now, um, but let me just pause right there. Um, if there's, you know, I can certainly talk at length about some, some directions here. Maybe I'll just uh, do one, but I'd really love to kind of get your thoughts on this domain. You know, you can propose your own topic, react to something that I've said. Let me just pause right there and turn it over to Sandy for if, if there's anything cropping up or if I should kind of move forward. Uh, so <clears throat> I actually have a question, but in the meantime, if anyone else in the audience has a question, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A. Uh, so one thing that really stood, stood out to me was kind of how do you kind of incentivize certain types of research, right? Given there's a gap between what cutting edge research might look like versus what can be commercialized. And the second study really it is very consistent with some you know, PIs that I've interacted with, with, you know, they're star academics, but they have no interest whatsoever in commercializing anything that comes out of their lab, even though there might be value there, but they, they have no, no interest. And so, you know, does the, would the university want to incentivize that type of academic star to, you know, work with a tech transfer office more, or do you, organized differently, kind of th your third bullet point to mm -hmm. put teams together where people are more interested in commercialization and have those lead to potential kind of revenue? Yeah, I think it's a big policy question. I think there's no doubt. Let me kind of address that in two ways. One is I've seen some discussion. I'm, I'm certainly not the insider here, but there I've seen op-eds written up and published in things like Science Magazine or Nature with by prominent university officials and policymakers explicitly saying, hey, we should be incentivizing people to, you know, our research staff to not just produce uh, re research that just goes in the basic research journal, so that's good, but we should actually be giving some credit for those that are able to, uh, you know, do this, this span uh, to the commercial world as well. That's not live alone in terms of, of that, but because it's hard to really change these, these norms and um, uh, processes on promotion, et cetera, inside academia. But I think that it, it'd be hard for us to argue that particularly when you see some of these eye-popping technologies that I spotlighted in one of the slides, like those are not just you know, small innovations that affects you know, one region uh, of the world, et cetera. These are, total game changers, whether you're talking about encryption technology for the web, or of course the COVID vaccines, uh, or various therapies that are just becoming so prominent now. And so it's a broader question uh, that, you know, is certainly an important and, and large one. But one thing that I will say based on the evidence that we saw in that second study published in Management Science, the if you're an academic star, and, and consistent with that third study as well, an academic star is not the same as a commercial star. And they behave differently and they have, they, um, so it's, I think it, it kind of invokes a little bit of that pastor's quadrant type of, it, for those of you who are familiar with that framework in terms of selecting problems that are both, you know, deep in terms of contribution to science as well as valuable in terms of the commercial world as well. But certainly that is, that is a really um, important, I think, domain to think about, uh, at least as part of the envir business environment that we consider when we think about uh, these avenues as well. Okay, so let me, are there other kind of questions here or should I kind of resume? If okay, I also have a question while we have yes. time for the attendees to think. Uh, this was very interesting uh, when you talked about the distinction between these academic stars and the commercial stars. And in particular, the definition of the commercial star being repeated patents, uh, uh, perhaps inventors and licensors, uh, that was still uh, someone whose primary occupation 
and priority is in academia, if I understood it correctly, that said in parallel, they've engaged more of these commercial practices. Now, as we think about the pastor's quadrant at the team level, at the founding team, perhaps for a startup, do you see this be an expansion to perhaps academic founders and employee founders? that come together in a focal context and maybe some sort of performance advantage for them in the market so that we can take some of these uh, conclusions from the individual level unit of analysis to firm level and founding team. Thanks, Maka. It's really interesting that you bring this up because um, we've just, uh, together with the co-author, just concluded a paper on exactly that topic and it's not quite ready for dissemination almost. But one, you know, one starting block of all this, just one fact that I would like to put out there is that over half of newly minted PhDs in the United States and in the UK do not go into tenure track positions. What's the implication of that? There are a lot of specialized human capital uh, people out there who could, are very, very skilled deep in a technical domain, some of whom, as you know, uh, you know, other research suggests, could be interested in either starting or joining a startup. And all too often in the literature, we pay attention to the individual human capital characteristics of these individuals, rather than you know, looking at the composition of the team. And one thing that we know is that there's a lot of homophily going on in everything from your friendships to your founding teams. And so maybe not surprisingly, if you look at the scientific PhD teams, they tend to be you know, also highly scientific, um, et cetera. But what we do find is that if you're able, if you're a STEM founder, if you're able to kind of uh, invite onto your founding team, someone with a very different background, say business, marketing, law, et cetera, that dramatically changes the picture on these academic founders. Uh, when you look to the success of these companies. But that's, again, for a different day. But I think what you're pointing out is incredibly important and an opportunity for the literature, which is to move beyond just the siloed individual and conceptualize this at the team level. And I would even go a little bit further because um, if there are early in, uh, venture capital investors or other type of investors that could be resources for you for which you could extend your reach in terms of resources that could be quite valuable as well. And so we're finding uh, some interesting patterns there. So um, look out for a new working paper on exactly that topic pretty soon on my website. Okay, so let me, um, you know, why don't I do the following, which is let me kind of resume back on the presentation and then reserve time again at the end. Uh, please do kind of submit questions in the chat, but for now I'm just gonna move ahead a little bit here. These are just some directions here that illustrate, I'm not gonna say, spend too much time here, but you, know, you could really think about whether it's the big data route, it's the small data, but very deep route, or thinking about field experiments or thinking about some counterfactuals at the team, other levels to really kind of enter into this particular world. So that's the, the one branch. Upstream, if universities are, are generating more technology and innovation that could be accessed by um, you know, incumbent firms, by startup founders, that's really quite exciting. The other path for startup, for established companies is, well, let's just, rather than kind of paying for efforts, that is internal R&D, let's just pay for performance or pay for product by acquiring these startups. And so I wanna talk about, uh, I think two papers here that, that I've been doing recently in, in this tradition. Okay, so one, it just motivating um, data point here is what, I, what you're looking at here is a graph on the, you know, obviously on the x-axis is time, but on the y-axis is the ratio between either amount raised through M&A or number of deals, M&A divided by IPO. And so what's very clear is that this number is pretty much above one at all times and usually much higher than one, meaning that M&A as an exit route to liquidity for entrepreneurs, uh, at least these venture capital backed ones, that's just much more commonplace than exiting via uh, an IPO. One question that, that might surface is, well, 
as the entrepreneur, what's the optimal ownership structure if your goal is to be innovative, right? So should you stay private? You know, obviously in the news now with Twitter, uh, Twitter's um, potential takeover and um, potentially going private um, or being acquired or doing an IPO. And so that's a, obviously an incredibly hard question to answer because it's, it's hard to, to really observe counterfactuals, right? And so just to share an anecdote here about just in the world of, of, of counterfactuals, um, you know, Steve Jobs gets talked about all the time for Apple, but um, we also know that he's a really kind of is heavily associated with Pixar, uh, the movie studio as well. This is one anecdote that that was really quite salient to me. You know, Steve Jobs almost things are going so poorly for him at Pixar that he almost sells out to Microsoft. This is way before Toy Story and all those other great movies that you see at the bottom there. Um, and actually, it turns out the negotiator on behalf of Microsoft was, later on did some really um, interesting things, and uh, Nathan Mirbold. But this is what, what Nathan said. Um, you know, I was interested in them initially because we were interested in the graphics. We had this idea that maybe there's some technology we can invest in early on that would be relevant to personal computers later on. So that was the motivation of of Microsoft for acquiring Pixar. But Jobs really thinks about it. He, he decides he has this change of heart and you know, he almost goes through the, with the acquisition but ends up not doing it. Instead, he licenses the, the, the technology to Microsoft. And then in the next year, Pixar goes public and is a really, you know, really raising a huge amount of money, really doing well in the IPO market. Uh, really kind of is even beats out uh, Netscape for the largest IPO of the year. So that is a window into, and then of course, not it's like it's a causal story, but then off this, this, this is, this is a, a movie studio that takes off on all these hits going forward. But what we're going to try to do is to replicate this anecdote um, in a statistically meaningful sample to really invoke this idea that on the one hand, some companies actually do complete acquisitions or IPOs, but sometimes for maybe serendipitous or random reasons, they end up not completing the deal, the IPO or the M&A. And so we're going to capitalize on that type of methodology. Let me just quickly summarize it. We're going to look at these venture capital-backed biotech companies uh, over a 21-year 20 uh, 21 panel, um, you know, plus year sample, and then just to kind of take a look at you know, what regime they lived in, in terms of ownership structure, as well as the innovation outcomes. But what's important to our kind of um, methodology here is that we're going to look at near misses. We're going to look, we're going to compare actual, say, M&As or IPOs to those that were near misses, almost did like Pixar and M&A, or almost completed for uh, an IPO, but didn't complete it for reasons unrelated to innovation outcomes. And, you know, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but what, what, do you, what are the main findings here? What we do find is that if you want to promote innovation, the best ownership structure is private ownership. The worst is public ownership. So, you know, I think Elon Musk and others have the right instinct in terms of if you want to be sheltered from the relentless scrutiny, et cetera, Maybe it's better to, to, to be private. In the middle is M&A, but you could even break that out into two, two halves. One is being acquired by the uh, large public company for which you are salient and have to be disclosed all this information. That's worse than being acquired by uh, a large company or private company, but not having to disclose a lot of information. And then we kind of do some fancy stuff at the inventor year analysis to make sure that nothing else is going on um, and so that just kind of, if you're just to kind of give you a taste of the type of results you would find from this near miss type of methodology, you can see here that if you actually complete the IPO, you're worse off. Um, and if you complete the M&A, um, you're, you know, it's, it's a little bit mixed. And so if you're interested in more details on that, um, you can check out this paper that was published in Management Science on Entrepreneurial Exits and Innovation. Okay, then one more paper, it's at the working paper stage. Let me tell you quickly about it. Um, you know, there, there's this literature on, on, you know, acquisitions and integration, but, you know, lots of, the, of that literature 
is approach from the perspective of the established company, right? And here, what we're going to do is use a little bit of that lens, but put more of the startup entrepreneur at, at the center and think about the, the, the acquisition of, of startups and the integration of these technology-based startups if you, again, want to incentivize um, innovation. And the thing that, we, we, that this literature has talked about so much is this notion of structural integration. Do you kind of integrate structurally versus allow for, for independent operation? What we're going to do is, you know, really, and, and that's kind of like a more organizational level decision, but we're going to try to bring this down to the level of the team, right? And we're going to actually define this notion of inventor commingling as follows. We're going to say that there's deep integration at the team level post M&A if, if subsequently you see inventors coming together from the parent company that acquired and the startup that it acquired. And that's going to kind of unleash a little bit of something interesting in that maybe it's a way of, in the kind of evolutionary economics lens, thinking about it as mutating organizational routines. You could actually conceptually think about everybody on the team knowing and having the exact same experience. The only thing that you perturb is the fact that these inventors that come together in the future came from different organizations. And so that allows you to isolate what is the importance of coming from a different organization in terms of generating new ways in which you approach uh, the innovation process, even controlling for the amount of recombination and all these other constructs that we think about. And I think one thing that, that motivates this, I'm not gonna talk about this paper, but I'm gonna just, I put up this image that um, really hopefully makes the point that a lot of times we're trying to achieve diversity, knowledge diversity, because we know that that is, allows us to question principles, maybe recombine new things, et cetera. But the thing that we often forget in this literature is that at the organizational level, you can have actually two different ways of achieving, of, of achieving knowledge diversity. And it's all coming down to the team. So on the, on the top of this diagram, of course we can achieve diversity by having teams that are all different among them, right? That could be useful because they challenge each other, they bring new, new stocks of knowledge, the disadvantage is that they may move slower, they don't speak the same language, they don't start, start from the same knowledge backgrounds, et cetera. In contrast, you can achieve knowledge diversity at the firm level by having perfectly homogenous teams, but each team is different from each other. And so we're not gonna do this literally in this paper, but I want people you know, just kind of remind ourselves once you move from the individual level to the team level to the firm level, we can think about these constructs that we've always had in the literature, most saliently, saliently knowledge diversity, that can be designed in dramatically different fashions. And so in this paper that I'm going to talk about, not, not this other paper that looks suspiciously like that Squid Games um, <laughs> kind of signage there, but, you know, there's been less attention paid to, to whether and how to organize the combined talent. And so that's what we're gonna to try to do here. Just let me just give you the quick pitch. Um, so we're gonna ask this research question, how does knowledge recombination via inventor commingling? Remember that's when you take inventors that were formerly from different organization and put them together in the same inventive team going forward. How does that relate to the, the success of these technology startup acquisitions uh, on these metrics of innovation, again, using these patent metrics. And of course, we know that teams, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you, I'm not gonna dive into the details, but we know that team formation, especially on m and that just doesn't happen randomly. And so we actually spent quite a bit of time, actually we hired two full-time RAs. This is their summer project, full-time, calculating this instrumental variable of direct flights that exogenously appeared or disappeared between city pairs that were centered on the acquiring and acquired company. That's an instrumental variable that's been validated in the, in the literature 
mainly economics and finance literature, but we exploit that to try to understand if our results are entirely driven by endogenous team formation or not. Let me just kind of cut quickly to the results so that we have more time to discuss the, the, the bigger picture ideas. So um, those acquisitions that have a higher intensity of inventor commingling, that is really um, positively related um, and uh, you know, to firm level innovation outcomes as judged by many different metrics that we're able to, to, to measure. And you can even think about, you know, if you think about structural integration as a very blunt weapon or a very blunt, not weapon, <laughs> a tool in that we're gonna just kind of impose this thing. But what's interesting about inventor commingling is it could be a lot more surgically targeted to what you wanna do. Maybe in this division, you wanna do it. Maybe this, this subdivision, this area, you wanna kind of encourage that or incentivize this, but over here, you don't wanna do it. So that it's interesting from that kind of, of specificity standpoint. And um, really kind of, you can, you can go a little bit further on, I, I won't go into the details, it's a little bit more nuanced, but what's interesting about our, if you take this down to the inventor level, what we do here is that every all inventors in our sample experience an M&A, but only some of our inventors experienced a pre-M&A alliance structure. And so what you can do is you can do some fancy econometrics here on within person estimation. You know, I lived under two different regimes. I lived under a regime in which we simply had an alliance structure with the counterparty. And I also lived under a regime in which the counterparty bought our company. And so you can go a little bit further on this question of, you know, organizational structure and how that relates to innovation outcomes. Um, but if you're interested in those details, this is a, a, a working paper that's together with a doctoral student, Ching Ching Chen. Look out for her on the job market next year. She's coming your way. Um, and let me just kind of end as I did before um, with just a few thoughts and now I'm gonna open it up. So definitely start getting your questions uh, ready uh, for our broad discussion. I alluded uh, in, in just in two minutes or so when I wrap up, the first one I alluded to before, like let's, you know, we know about the M&A, but actually what's interesting is when you're thinking about interorganizational R&D collaboration, that's it, and the market for, uh, for these innovations, there's many different ways to organize that. And so let's be systematic about thinking about the, you know, the trade-offs associated with that. Now the literature has started a little bit of that, but I think that we have a long way to go and it's super hard to do it. So I'm not beating up the literature, but certainly let's, you know, uh, consider the entire landscape here and those trade-offs. The other one I want to just kind of pause on, because I think it's really kind of interesting in that we're entering this world in which there's, it's not exactly self-organized teams and firms. So I, I wanted to, some of you may not be familiar with this company, Supercell. So let me talk a little bit about it. Supercell is a Finnish software gaming company. Uh, they've released five titles. You might know about some of these, Clash of Clans, Brawl Stars, Clash Royale, you know, those, those, those great titles that your kids probably are obsessed on. But this, the, and this is each, each one of those titles multi, it has made at least a billion dollars uh, and Clash of Plants over $10 billion. And the way that they organize their R&D is really interesting. And I think that the title of their, their company says it all, Supercell. So what the CEO does, and I happen to be for, so fortunate to kind of do a webinar fireside chat with the, the CEO, the founder of Supercell. All he does is he approves or disapproves the team composition. Then the team has supreme autonomy to go through the prototype, to release the game. No one else around the firm, including the founder CEO is allowed any veto power. So that gives supreme authority to the uh, developers to really, you know, express themselves. Now we could argue maybe that's too, that, that sets the, the threshold too high because they've not re, they have not released a single product or game that sold less than a billion dollars. And their last game that they released was four years ago. This is a company that by the way is, is owned um, by, I believe Tencent. It used to be um, owned by um, a different company 
But in, in any case, I, I think that, you know, if we thought about the way they organize, and then even fast forwarding to maybe the organization of the future in terms of blockchain governance through distributed autonomous organizations, and we're going to pre-specify constitutions, voting protocols, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I could talk at length on this one because it's a super interesting context, but I, I don't. I want to leave enough of time for a, a general discussion. But I think that this, this whole domain of really thinking about where we source innovation is that through you know, the, the usual ways we've done it. So we may even be experiencing a, a next evolution. We, as, start, as established companies, we rely on universities or acquiring startups. Is there a way forward in terms of getting, you know, whether it's in the startup world, the self-organized world, the, the um, established company world, a way to self-organize, to empower, to put on just some, some structure and then just really let it go in terms of the unleashing innovation, et cetera. I know that's quite far ranging. Um, I see that we have eight minutes or so left. So let me stop there. If you guys want me to talk more, I'm certainly happy to do that, but I'm also actually much more interested in some of your thoughts um, and discussions. Great, so we actually, we do have a couple of questions that have come through the Q&A. Uh, so let's start with uh, Stan. You can you can go. I think Ryan will unmute you, and then you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Uh, thank you. So um, so I had a question that that actually fits more into the first part of your talk. So I was a bit okay. late with putting it in. Sorry about that. Um, so it relates to your initial observation about heterogeneity between universities in terms of their licensing income. That, that shows that universities seem to differ a lot in terms of their capability to, to commercialize and use markets for technology. Yeah. So my question was about, uh, well, what do you think about online markets for technology? So, so I'm talking about things like pharmalicensing.com and these types of things. So I've been looking into it and they have a lot of entries by university TTOs. Mm -hmm. So technologies that they offer for licensing so, and I've been wondering about whether that could be a novel way of commercializing university technology that can increase the value capture by universities. And there are a number of reasons I think why that might be the case. Uh, so there might be lower search costs to find licensees. You have like these disembodied descriptions of technologies on these platforms that might increase the application areas and so on. Um, so that relates to this heterogeneity between universities, I think, because well, if you're Stanford, you know all your potential licensees, probably. And well, I'm not the big expert on this, but but it seems to be a very small world, is my impression from, from my talks with these kind of people. So you phone up some people, they know some people, and so on. But let's say that the lesser gods among the TTOs might have more difficulties finding licensees. So I was wondering whether this new organizational forum, if you will, of markets for technologies could, could actually deal with that. Yeah, I don't have a great answer. I do have a very good friend who is a CEO founder of a company called yet2.com that tries to do this in that they take technologies from some unnamed, unnamed corporations that are underutilized and try to market them, et cetera. One thing is very clear is that this is not a frictionless market in that you can't just kind of put up some uh, you know, technology and, and hope to be all that successful. And that we know from the strategies of university technology transfer offices. And so then that leaves this big question of how can we improve the odds that um, this, you know, whether it be a prototype stage or proof of concept stage or interesting, or interesting um, corporations to come in to do some further maturation of the technology so it can have more proof of concept, or is it just simply search frictions that are, that are prevalent here? And so I, I think that uh, certainly it's an important domain. I would certainly encourage people to really understand the context. And it, the difficulty of course is it's, it's not well con controlled in the natural world. And so thinking about how to kind of isolate a lever on this, it's always the difficult question. But I, I, I do think that for sure, 
this notion of digitalization, et cetera, is going to touch all facets, if they haven't already, of our, of, of our lives, including this one. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Oh, indeed. I, so I think there are a lot of uh, frictions on there. So I've talked to some licensing uh, uh, responsibles at pharma companies, and, and they said, well, we're not just going to look on these online markets for technology, and, and we're not just going to do a lot of searching there. So, so I think it's probably naive indeed. So, so as you say, if universities just throw whatever they have on these platforms, then assume that licensees are going to show up. That's not going to work. But so it's, it's probably a matter of using it in the right way yeah okay thanks so uh shifting focus back to the second half i'd like to ask colleen to unmute colleen are you still there yes okay i'm muted yes hi david um so i just had a question about you um about the second paper and kind of informed by your discussion of the first, which is thinking about, you know, one motivation for acquisition from incumbents is sort of specialization or a division of labor. Like I buy your technologies and then I take them and I release you to do more technologies and you become specialist provider and I become a specialist commercializer. So with that in mind, I was just thinking about your results on commingling and the, res and the idea of commingling and just if you could comment on how you think about reconciling those two sort of things. Yeah, um, I think what, what's interesting, and this is the thing that is really, to me, quite fascinating, which is really this thought experiment. We thought about this thought experiment where, okay, let's keep everything constant about, you know, the only thing that differs on these teams is not the expertise, the domain of knowledge, et cetera. The only thing that differs here is that team A, everyone is from the same organization. And in, and in team B, same stock of knowledge, same experience, specialization, et cetera. The only thing that differs in team B is that they happen to come from different organizations together. And so, you know, if I had to speculate as to the kind of mechanisms behind this and you know definitely maybe we, we've taken the li you know liberties too far here but I really had this um, image of maybe it's I'm being too influenced by the evolutionary e economics um, water in the the Wharton coming out of the Wharton taps but certainly this this idea of mutating organizational routines like if we're all in the same organization and we've been doing things together, we have a kind of a standard operating procedure of how we're going to do things. Uh, we always follow this playbook, or when we encounter this problem, we always do this X, Y, or Z. But if we have this other type of organization in which, yeah, we all are experts in our respective domains, but the way that we did things in our prior organization is just very, very different than the way that the organization that acquired us would do things when they confront you know, this fork in the road. That could be interesting in terms of you know, discussion, how we move from here, not just relying on the way that we always do things, the generic solution. And so obviously this is, I, I'm speaking too liberally, in terms of how we can, exactly what we can say. But I think there's um, some, you know, glimmers of interesting patterns because what we're finding is that there is quite a big difference in these type of regimes. And then of course, I didn't even uh, talk about this difference between ownership structure. That is, and we could go deep on the theory there about like, what if, you know, I'm the same person, but, I'm living under these two regimes. Before we just had an alliance structure or the other we had an M&A structure. We find that in the, under the M&A structure, I'm much more productive. And we speculate that one possible reason there, I, I'm noticing I should wrap up, is that really, if you thought about an alliance, we, we, everything has to be codified in the alliance. Whereas the benefit of ownership as in an M&A is like, even if we didn't think about it, I'm, I, I'm the owner. And so 
in the R&D context, a lot of times we can't chart out all the contingencies. And so we may need to really, in some circumstances, actually have ownership of this, right? which is much more costly, right? As compared to the more lighter touch alliance type of structure. So let me pause there because I know that we're beyond time. And let me actually just thank everyone. I know that it's a busy time of year. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to uh, listen. Hopefully this wasn't just a you know infomercial kind of thing, but hopefully this will spur some um, thoughts. And definitely if, if you would like to chat further offline, et cetera, get in touch with me and we'll set up a time to talk. Thanks everyone. Great. So we do have more questions, but we we are at time. So David, I would just like to thank you so much again for your your insights and also providing so much food for thought for future research direction. And I also wanted to thank all of you for joining us today in our discussion. And I hope to see you at our our next session coming up in a couple of weeks. So uh, thank you and take care and see you soon.